Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. Uh, thanks for being here tonight. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to just give it one more minute to get uh, other folks on the call and we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Amy Salata. I'm the Outreach and Advocacy Manager at the Student Borrower Protection Center. Um, welcome to our webinar tonight. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, and then, uh, you know, as folks join in, uh, they can just pop in and, and we're recording this. So we'll send it out later, um, along with a thank you note with some resources for joining tonight. Um, and everyone will get that who registered for the event. So um, so no worries if you couldn't be here. Um, so, uh, I'm with the Student Borrower Protection Center. We're a national nonprofit policy organization focused solely on alleviating the burden of, debt, of student debt in the country. And we do this through a mixture of advocacy, policymaking, and litigation strategy to rein in industry abuses, protect borrowers' rights, and advance economic opportunity for the next generation of students. Um, we're going to be going over a lot of information today. Um, here is our agenda. Uh, so we'll talk about return to repayment, um, the, something called the IDR account adjustment. We'll go over how that interacts with the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, um, what Fresh Start is for bar for borrowers who are in default, um, go through very high level what this, the Supreme Court decision was this summer and any relief, um, updates on relief um, for, for debt relief. Um, we'll review some important takeaways and then we will be joined by my colleague, Kat Welbeck, um, our Director of Advocacy and Civil Rights Council to um, help us work through some of your questions. If you have questions at any point, please put them in the Q&A feature at the bottom um, of your Zoom screen, and we'll get to them at the end. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, and I think other than that, we can get started. <clears throat> so return to repayment. So that might be top of mind for folks because um, it's we're currently in the throes of it. Um, we're a couple months in. Um, but what does this mean? So as I'm sure you already know, the payment pause uh, that was for most federal borrowers ended on August 30th of this year and interest started accruing in September, and then payments were due in October. Your first payment should have been due in October. Um, if you haven't already, you could update your contact information at studentaid.gov and at your servicer's website. Um, if you were previously enrolled in an income-driven repayment program, or plan, I'm sorry, um, you can you should continue to uh, enroll and recertify um, those, you know, your income so that you have a lower payment each month. Um, if you don't know what this means, that's okay. We're going to go over what income driven repayment means. Um, but just uh, focusing that if you were in, in enrolled in one of those that uh, you'll have to recertify in March of next year. Um, and so uh, that's just something to keep in mind moving forward. 
Um, and then also, if you had automatic payments set up before the pandemic, um, they shouldn't have started automatically. And so if they did, that is a problem because the Department of Education said that they weren't going to do that. Um, but also, we've heard some stories about folks that that was happening too. So um, it might be a good idea to just check your bank account, make sure that wasn't happening, um, and then re-enroll if you want automatic payments set up. Um, all right. So the first step really in all this, in preparing for this return to repayment, which I already started, um, is to log into studentaid.gov. This is your clearinghouse. This is the federal student aids uh, website um, for all things related to your federal loans. And so you can see the login button at the top here. Um, and if you don't remember your password, you can reset that as well as your um, username. You, know, you can get that sent to your email. Once you're there, you could figure out who your servicer is, what type of loans you have, find out if you're in default, um, and then update your contact information. Um, so all this information is available for your federal student loans at studentaid.gov. Um, as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, this is what the right-hand side of studentaid.gov looks like. Um, it'll show you your upcoming payment and who your servicer is, um, and then you know the due date of your next payment. And then below that, you can go directly to the um, website of your servicer. And so this person's servicer is Mohila, and you can go right to Mohila from this website or from from this dashboard. Um, once you're at your servicer site, you know you could shake you sh you could make sure that your balances are the same, that they match with at studentaid.gov. Um, check when your next payment is due. You should have received a bill. 21 days before your first payment was due. Um, and that's true moving forward. And so, um, you know, you could check your inbox to make sure that you didn't receive a bill or that you did receive a bill. And, um, you know, that's that's where you would kind of figure out where where those bills are and, and that those like communications from your servicer. All right, so next we're gonna get into something called income-driven repayment. Um, these are payment plans that are tied to your income. And so they fluctuate based on what your income is, right? So we've got, different types of payment plans here. The first is, uh, I'm sorry, the top left corner is the standard repayment plan. This is what you're automatically put into when you um, when you graduate and after your six month grace period, um, you know, it has you paying off the entire balance of the loan in 10 years. Um, to the right of that is the extended repayment plan that has a longer term of the loan. Um, so it has you paying off uh, that loan. So over a longer period of time um, and uh, you know, so your, your monthly payments are a bit lower. Graduated repayment um, has you starting off with very low payments, but then coming to, you know, very high payments once, um, you know, once you reach the end of the term of the loan. Um, and then income-driven repayment, as I mentioned, is is um, contingent upon your, your income. And so you have to recertify each year um, to demonstrate what your income is so they can calculate what how much you have to pay on a monthly basis. Your payment could be as low as $0 a month. Um, if you know if you are under the income thresholds that they have set for different um, plans under this income driven or payment kind of uh, umbrella. So what this means, um, you you know so these are based on your income, your remaining balance, one of the really nice things about this these plans is that your remain, remaining balance is forgiven after 20 or 25 years in repayment. Um, if you're seeking public service loan forgiveness, which we can talk about in a little bit, um, that has you paying, or I'm sorry, that has the remaining balance being, you know, canceled or forgiven after 10 years under the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. There are four plans that currently fall under income-driven repayment. They're listed here at the bottom. It's ICR, IBR, pay, and repay. The repay plan is being phased out um, next summer, and it will become the new SAVE plan, which President Biden announced um, last year. And so we'll get into what that looks like um, and what the SAVE plan is, too. All right, so um, if you're interested in income-driven repayment, because it's often the most affordable option for many folks, uh, you can go to studentaid.gov slash IDR and sign up there. You could also call your servicer and ask to be put on an IDR plan or ask what your monthly payment might be on those plans. Um, there's also something called the income, or I'm sorry, um, the repayment calculator tool at studentaid.gov. If you even just Google those words, uh, income, or I'm sorry, calculator, um, repayment calculator tool, um, you can find that at studentaid.gov and it'll basically tell you a ballpark of what your monthly payment might be under each of these plans and under different um, plans in general. Um, so now getting to the SAVE repayment plan, which is um, an abbreviation or an acronym for saving on a valuable education plan. Um, President Biden announced this last August in conjunction with um, the debt relief plan that he announced. And basically this new plan 
um, protects more of your income. And so, um, you know, the, the income exemption has been raised from 150% of the federal poverty line to 225% of the federal poverty line, which means that your monthly payment will be much lower. It also eliminates all of the interest um, on both your subsidized and unsubsidized loans after you make a payment. And if you are, um, if you file your taxes uh, separately from your spouse, if you have a spouse, um, it excludes your spousal income from that calculation. And so all this means that, you know, these monthly payments are um, typically, you know, much more affordable than some of these other plans. And here you can see that working out, you know, this is your uh, estimated monthly payment under the safe plan based on your income on the left and your family size on the bottom. Um, and so there are a lot of zeros here. And, and, you know, if you are required to make a zero dollar payment, that means that you're still in repayment status, but you're not having to make a payment, um, which essentially gets you credit towards those 25 or 20 or 25 year marks. Um, or if you're seeking PSLF, you know, towards those 10 years where you can get your debt canceled. All right, um, so those are the things that have already been rolled out on the safe plan. It's being rolled out gradually. The last two things that will be implemented this summer in July um, are that if you only have undergraduate debt, you'll have to pay 5% of your discretionary income. And if you have um, graduate student debt, you'll have to pay a weighted average between five and 10% of your discretionary at, um, income. Uh, that was previously at 10%. So it again, lowers those monthly payments for folks. And then the last really exciting thing about the safe plan um, is that it has a shortened timeline for folks who took out, um, you know, uh, lower balance loans from the from the beginning. And so if you borrowed less than twelve thousand dollars for your, you know, for your education initially, um, and you've been in repayment for ten years, you have a right to get your debt canceled under the safe plan. So that means that come July you know, um, a, a, a huge swath of people will get their debt canceled because they, you know, borrowed less than $12,000 initially and were have been in repayment for 10 years. Um, and this goes up on a sliding scale. So um, from there, you know, uh, if you've borrowed less than $13,000 and you've been in repayment for 11 years um, and so on, it goes up in that way. And so um, that's another option to, to keep in mind um, in terms of getting the remaining balance canceled after um, putting in time in cancellation, or I'm sorry, in repayment. All right, so here are the eligible plans for the, I'm sorry, the eligible loans for the safe plan. Um, one uh, exception on these direct consolidation loans um, under the loans listed here is um, Parent PLUS loans. I can uh, just kind of point folks in the right direction of some resources on Parent PLUS loans um, and possibly getting them into the safe plan. Um, in a little bit, but um, generally they are not included in um, the save plan. Um, if you were already enrolled in the repay plan, you will be automatically enrolled in save, um, and then everyone else can sign up at studentaid.gov slash IDR or contact your servicer. Okay. Um, one more thing that is related to return to repayment, but also kind of works nicely with the save plan is that they, um, President Biden has announced this on-ramp period. Um, that will last until September 30th of next year. And basically what this means is that if you miss a payment, you won't have some of the ne negative ramifications that you would have had in the past. Um, so you won't be considered delinquent. You're not going to be sent to credit bureaus by the Department of Education itself. Um, you won't be placed in default or referred to any debt collection agencies. Um, if you don't make payments, you know, the interest will continue to accrue on those loans. And if you're seeking something like public service loan forgiveness and you miss a payment, those, you know, periods of time won't count towards PSLF. Um, but, you know, you won't have these ne negative ramifications that I mentioned. Um, one other thing I want to mention on this front is that if you know that you're one of those people that borrowed less than $12,000 initially, and you, you've been in repayment for, um, you know, a really long time, over 10 years, um, and you know that you're going to get your debt canceled come July if you were enroll and save, um, you know, it might make sense for some of those folks to to not make payments um, until they have their debt canceled in July and, and utilize this on-ramp period. Um, so that is just another option that I wanted to, to throw out there on this front. All right, so um, we talked about income-driven repayment. Now we're going to go over something called the IDR account adjustment. Essentially, as I mentioned, um, with these income-driven repayment plans, after 20 or 25 years in repayment, you have a right to get your debt canceled. Um, a number of reports came out last year that um, 
basically demonstrated that this this program hasn't been working. Um, that you know fewer than 200 people out of a universe of over 4 million people have ever had their debt canceled through um, income driven repayment plans. And servicers were routinely steering people into forbearances and deferments rather than offering them income driven repayment plans that might have kept them in repayment and gotten them on track and gotten them over this um, these thresholds of 20 or 25 years. Um, and it's 20 years if you just have undergraduate loans and 25 years if you have a mixture of undergraduate and graduate loans. So that's where those thresholds come in. Um, so because of all this information that all these reports kind of came out saying, the Department of Education has tried to rectify this using this one-time revision of uh, all student, I'm sorry, federal um, student loan accounts. Essentially what they're doing is they're going through and doing an audit of everyone's accounts, trying to see how close people are to that 20 or 25 year mark in repayment. Um, and see who's over you know, those thresholds and cancel that debt. And so they're counting basically all this time that's on this page, they're counting basically everything except for in-school deferment and time in, spent in default. Um, this is something that we have continued to advocate, advocate for because we know a lot of folks have been in default, um, not because of their own fault, but because of service or mismanagement or other things. Um, and so at any rate, um, they're counting all this time um, to get you credit towards these thresholds of 20 or 25 years or 10 years for PSLF. Um, what this means is that uh, this will be automatic for most folks, but there are people that have to consolidate before the end of this year, which means you know, in, in just two weeks, before the, the 31st of December, um, you'll need to consolidate if you wanna kind of take part in this IDR account adjustment. Those folks have commercial fell loans and Perkins loans, basically any loans that are not directly held by the Department of Education. So oh, um, you might be thinking, how do I figure that out? How do I know if I have a commercial fell loan or a, a Perkins loan? Um, we're gonna go back to studentaid.gov. That's really where your clearinghouse is. This is where you can tell what type of loans you have to find out if you need to consolidate or not. Um, so once you're there, you'll get to your, your uh, dashboard and from your dashboard, you'll be able to see what type of loans you have. This is what the, a screenshot of the dashboard looks like. Um, you only need to worry about the ones with the balance because those are the ones that you're trying to get canceled or um, you know, the ones that you have to worry about. Um, here you can see that this person had uh, a direct, I'm sorry, has two different types of consolidation loans. So they already consolidated before, but they have um, you know, an unsubsidized one and a subsidized one. You really only need to worry um, about you know, the word direct um, means that you have a direct loan. That's been the main type of loan since 2010. Um, and is eligible for, for most of the things that we're gonna talk about tonight. And so, um, you know, if you have a direct loan, that is not, you know, they're, they're directly held by the Department of Education, so you don't need to worry about consolidating. Um, you can see here at the bottom that this person previously had a Perkins loan, a Perkins loan, so they, um, you know, consolidated to kind of take advantage of this. Um, you know, you're also looking for that word FELL, those federal family education loans. Um, and those loans are no longer issued by the federal government, but they're still kind of floating around in the ether. And so um, there are two different types of fell loans. There are ones that are held directly by the Department of Education and ones that are held by private lenders. Those who are held by private lenders need to consolidate in order to take part in this IDR account adjustment. Um, you can see here that there's um, a screenshot of these fell loans in the second block Wells Fargo is listed as the private lender. And so that's an example of a private lender. Um, and then at the bottom, um, you can see that the fourth block says, you know, that it's Department of Education slash Mohila. So that's an example of an, uh, one that's held by the Department of Education. Um, in addition, if you were receiving the payment pause, that's one way to tell. So you weren't required to make payments the past three and a half years or so. Um, you had, you know, a fellow loan that was held by the Department of Education. And if you were required to make payments, then you, um, you know, had a, one of these commercial loans that's owned by a private lender. Um, and so that is how you tell which type of loan you have and whether or not you need to consolidate. Um, so let's just run through some of the steps that you need to take in order to take part in this IDR account adjustment. Um, so remember to check what type of loans you have at studentaid.gov. If you have a loan that isn't held by the Department of Education, like one of those commercial fell loans or a Perkins loan, um, they need to be consolidated before December 31st of this year in order to um, have your account adjusted. The Department of Education has already started making these adjustments to accounts, and they've started with folks that have been in repayment the longest. So if you um, have eligible loans um, and you have been in repayment for 20 or 25 years, 
depending on your situation, you know, you, uh, you know, these folks have already seen their debt canceled. And so um, the number is now in the, uh, the billions, I believe, and um, close to a million people have seen their debt canceled um, already. Everyone else, um, you know, if you aren't already at or above those thresholds of 20 or 25 years, everyone else will see their account adjusted sometime next year. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is to account for the deadline of December 31st, which is really important. Um, and so if you, you know, want to take part in this, um, you need to consolidate before that deadline. Okay, let's talk about how public service loan forgiveness interacts with this IDR account adjustment right now in this moment in time. So public service loan forgiveness is a, um, a government program that was enacted by Congress in 2007 um, to help borrowers with their student loan debt, who help to help um, specifically public service workers with their student loan debt and to um, make sure that, uh, you know, their student loans weren't a deterrent from entering the public service moving forward. Typically, there are four requirements for the program. You have to have a direct loan. Um, as I mentioned, that's been the main loan type since 2010. Um, and so you have to have a direct loan in order to qualify for public service loan forgiveness. But if you have one of those other loans I mentioned, like a Fell loan or a Perkins loan, you can consolidate your loans to make them eligible, to make them direct loans um, for PSLF. The second requirement is that you have to be in, an, in the right type of repayment plan, which for most folks will be an income-driven repayment plan. You can also remain on the standard plan, um, but if you remember that kind of chart I showed in the very beginning, the standard plan has you paying off the entirety of your loan in 10 years anyway. And so income-driven repayment plans are often um, plans that offer lower monthly payments so that you can you know, make lower payments each month and then get the balance canceled after 10 years. Um, third, you need to be in the right type of employment, which is um, a public service employer, which is defined as any level of government. So federal, state, local, or tribal governments, any 501c3 nonprofit, or certain other nonprofits. Um, what usually falls into that last category of like certain other nonprofits is um, something like emergency services. You know, maybe you're not um, in a 501c3, maybe you're not working directly for a government, but you're, you know, they've kind of uh, said that you are seen as working for the public service. And you have to work full time, uh, which is defined as 30 hours a week. Um, you can also have multiple part time jobs that add up to 30 hours a week that get you um, over the threshold for PSLF. Finally, you need to make the right number of payments, which is 120 payments on a direct loan in an income-driven repayment plan while working full-time for the public service. Um, and so, you know, you have to uh, meet that final requirement while meeting all the other requirements as well. Um, so right now, oh, one other thing I want to mention is that um, all those months that you, we've been in the payment pause, if you weren't required to make payments during that time, all those months, um, that three and a half years counts towards PSLF. And so, um, you know, it is a benefit that, you know, you haven't been required to make payments, but if you've been working for a nonprofit or a government this whole time, um, that time has counted towards PSLF. Um, another really particular thing about this moment in time is that uh, PSLF is interacting with the IDR account adjustment. Basically what it means is they are essentially waiving the first two requirements here. So if you didn't have a direct loan already and you weren't already in an income driven repayment plan, it's a good time to rectify those things. Um, you know, right now, before December 31st in particular, um, so that you can get the maximum amount of credit on your loans applied, you know, towards PSLF. Um, so uh, what this means is that if you have some of those older loans that I mentioned, like a Fell or a Perkins loan, um, you need to consolidate before December 31st in order to, um, you know, make your loans direct and eligible for the public service loan forgiveness, and you're able to keep all that credit on your loan. Um, in addition, if you haven't previously filed a public service loan forgiveness form, these are basically the forms that say, um, you know, I worked at this place for such and such amount of time um, and your employer verifies that you worked there. Um, you know, it's a good time to kind of rectify that situation as well. The consolidation deadline is December 31st, but you can file a PSLF form at any time. Um, we recommend that folks interested in PSLF, file one uh, once a year and every time you switch jobs um, to make sure that you're on track for public service loan forgiveness. Um, there were a lot of historical issues with the program. And so by filing one every year and every time you change jobs, you're able to um, catch any mistakes in real time and deal with them as they come. Um, all right, so let's just review a note on parent plus borrowers. 
Parent PLUS borrowers are generally eligible for the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Um, they weren't able to, um, they've been kind of historically excluded from a lot of different things. Um, but last year, the Department of Education announced that, um, you know, these Parent PLUS borrowers can get PSLF credit through this IDR account adjustment. Um, so their action items are a little bit different. You know, they still have to submit PSLF forms, which verifies their public service um, since October 1st of 2007 when the program began. Um, you could also consider consolidating to get on an income-driven repayment plan. Um, Parent PLUS borrowers, the only income-driven repayment plan that they are eligible for is the income contingent repayment plan, and they're only eligible for that when they consolidate. Um, and the income contingent repayment plan, or the ICR plan, is the least generous of these plans. And so for some folks, it might make more financial sense to stay on the standard plan, um, especially given that, you know, maybe you've had three and a half years where you haven't had been required to make payments. Um, and then, um, you know, for other folks, it might make sense to go on the ICR plan. There is another option called double consolidation um, that essentially has folks consolidating their loans twice. And once they consolidate um, their loans two times and make one final direct loan, um, that final loan will, you know, is eligible for save and the other income driven repayment plans. It is a little bit complicated. It's not an easy process. Um, there is a great resource from the Massachusetts Attorney General on double consolidation. Um, happy to answer more questions about that at the end and we can share that resource out um, tomorrow in a note. Um, but uh, just wanted to present that as an option as well. Okay, oh, remember the deadline to consolidate is December 31st of 2023. Um, consolidation is a really relatively easy process. It happens at studentaid.gov um, for your federal loans. And basically, you know, you, you're um, taking out a new loan and it's paying off the old loan and replacing it with a direct loan, that, that loan type that's been the main one since 2010. Um, and so it takes about 30 minutes online. And then, um, you know, they might take, you know, four to six weeks to process it, maybe a little longer because of the holidays, um, but that's the general timeline and how it works. All right, so finally, let's just review some uh, tips on how to get PSLF credit through the IDR account adjustment. So first, check what types of type of loans you have. If you don't have direct loans, you need to consolidate them before December 31st to get the maximum amount of credit on your loans. Um, you can consolidate after, you know, the public service loan forgiveness program will always, you know, will, you know, will exist after December 31st. Um, but if you consolidate before December 31st, that's when you're able to get the maximum amount of credit on your loans. Um, if you're a parent plus borrower, you know, you, you could consider consolidating to get on the ICR plan, um, or you could remain on the standard plan, or you could look into double consolidation as an option as well. Um, and then remember to submit your public service loan forgiveness forms for all eligible public service work that you've had since October 1st of 2007. And you can do that at the PSLF help tool available at studentaid.gov. All right, oh, um, just a couple more points to hit before we get to your questions. We're gonna talk about Fresh Start, which is an initiative for borrowers who have been in default. Um, right now there are about 7 million folks in default. Um, and it can be really damaging. It can prevent people from getting cars and, and houses and, um, you know, destroy your credit. It can be really, um, really um, bad for folks. Um, and so essentially, Fresh Start is a way to get out of default that's a little bit easier than the normal route. Um, usually, if you're in default, you could either consolidate or rehabilitate to get out of default. Um, but uh, if you rehabilitate, that, that process often takes a long time. It's about 10 months. They make sure that you can make your payments. Um, and so, you know, this process is meant to be a little bit less onerous. Um, it restores all of your payment options, including those income-driven or payment plans, which, um, you know, maybe some folks would qualify for those $0 monthly payments. It also immediately restores your ability to go back to school and get aid to go back to school. Um, if you rehabilitated during the pandemic, you can uh, get that restored through this um, program of Fresh Start. And then it also restores your credit and it saves you from involuntary collections. These are the eligible defaulted loans and they must have been in default prior to March 13th of 2020. Um, because of the payment pause and, and, and because of um, guidance from the Department of Education, no one should have 
defaulted after March 13th of 2020. And so, um, you know, if you default after, you know, that date and, and after the payment pause um, or after this on-ramp period ends, those loans won't be eligible for fresh start. So um, right now it's a very uh, pressing thing and a good, a good time to be thinking about these things. These are ineligible defaulted loans. It's a smaller slice of the pie, but just want to put them up here in case this um, affects any folks. And then um, there are some action items, you know, like many of these things, it's not automatic. And so borrowers essentially have one year. Um, so until like August 30th of 2024 to do one of two things. You could either communicate with the default resolution group or your guarantee agency and request to enter a repayment plan or you could request aid from an eligible school. Um, so those are your two options and you have until August 30th to do them of next year. Um, in the latter option, you'll need to get a signed statement from you, you know, to your school saying that you agree to be transferred to a non-default servicer. If you don't do one of these things, um, you'll be placed back in default using um, the, I'm sorry, if you don't do one of these things in the time, it, you know, until, I'm um, sorry, until the, before the deadline of next year uh, in August, um, you'll be placed back in default using the original date of delinquency. All right, um, happy to answer more questions about default or about um, fresh start at the end. And then very briefly, I'm just gonna review um, some relief updates on, on broad-based debt relief. Um, so as I'm sure you remember, President Biden announced last year that he would cancel up to $20,000 in debt relief for any federal borrower um, who used a Pell Grant at any point in their educational career and $10,000 in relief for all other federal borrowers. This application was open for about six weeks in the um, end of 2022, and 26 million people applied during that time, um, which really speaks to the popularity and the necessity of something like this. Um, and during that time, 16 million people were already processed and approved. Um, in November of 2022, a federal judge in Texas and a panel of judges in Missouri uh, blocked this program. There was there were our oral arguments before the Supreme Court um, in 2023, and I'm sorry, in February of 2023. And then in June, um, the Supreme Court knocked it down in a 6-3 decision under the HEROES Act. Um, so what is happening right now is that um, the president is trying to pursue this through the Higher Education Act. Um, and this required a negotiated rulemaking uh, session, which actually just ended today. Um, there were three sessions, one in October, November, and December. Um, and although it ended today, we don't have concrete answers on what it will look like. Um, you know, the the proposed rule uh, on this will still need um, feedback from the general public. And so there will be an opportunity to kind of um, give your voice to this. Um, but like while we're waiting for this to happen, that's why, um, you know, we think folks should should know all the things that are available right now in order to get your debt canceled. Um, through different existing federal programs. So um, that's just a little bit of update on where we are at with um, broad-based debt relief. So now let's get to important takeaways and then we can get to your questions. Okay, um, so first check what type of loans you have because that affects your eligibility for different federal programs. So go to studentaid.gov, log in, um, you know, if you have uh, those commercial fell loans or Perkins loans, or if you have non-direct loans and you're interested in public service loan forgiveness, consider consolidating before December 31st to keep the maximum amount of credit on your loan to, to really take advantage of this moment in time. Um, you could check out your what your monthly payment will be using that loan simulator tool that I, um, or the repayment, repayment calculator tool that's available at studentaid.gov um, to get a ballpark idea of what your monthly payment will be. Um, consolidate before December 31st if you're um, one of those folks uh, interested in PSLF or the IDR account adjustment. Complete your PSLF forms. Um, if you're seeking PSLF, remember to do those uh, once a year and every time you change jobs to stay on track. Um, if you're in default, remember to take one of the action items to participate in Fresh Start. Um, so if you, you know, contact your uh, guarantee agency to get on a repayment plan or, um, con or I'm sorry, uh, request aid from an eligible school. Um, Finally, two more things. There's a lot moving right now. I'm sure you can tell that from this presentation. And so there's gonna be a lot of people looking to take advantage of that. So please beware of scams. Make sure you're getting your information from a trusted source like, um, like studentaid.gov. We also have a great resource called cancelmystudentdebt.org um, that has uh, like a lot of how-to guides, a lot of frequently asked questions um, on it uh, to kind of walk through if you need a little bit more um, information on some of these things. 
Um, and then one more thing, you know, file complaints if you experience any issues. I can't tell you how important these are um, for shaping the policy of the future. Um, and the more complaints that a given agency receives on a particular subject, the more likely they are to respond to that thing. And so um, you can file complaints with the ombudsman at the Federal Student Aid Office within the Department of Education. You can file a complaint with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, and then there's also ombudspersons at the state levels. Um, not all states have them, but about almost 20 do. And so um, we'll share that in the follow-up resource, but that's another option for filing complaints if um, you experience any issues. All right, so now let's get to your Q&A. Um, thanks, Kat, for, for coming on tonight. Um, and let's see what folks are interested in. For sure. And thank you, Amy. That was so much really useful information. So thank you for covering all that. Um, and then also just a note to everyone on the line. Um, we're going to go through our first couple of questions here, but feel free to drop in any questions you might have um, as we go through and answer them. Um, so Amy, our first question is about PSLF and someone's wondering about the status of their employer. So um, if someone worked for a qualifying employer, so for example, they may have worked for a school or worked for a government agency that is a qualifying employer, if their employer that may have been like a contracting agency or um, that employer was not a 501c3, are they eligible for PSLF? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so unfortunately, it really depends on who's on your W-2. And so if you were paid directly by um, like a third party or a staffing agency that is not a 501c3, um, then your time wouldn't count towards PSLF. It really, you know, it has to be a government or a 501c3 on your pay stub essentially um, to get that time to count. Um, and that's been another like point of um, contention on this program, you know, something that we've continued to advocate for too, um, you know, that, that more people should be included in, um, in this program. Thanks so much, Amy. And then also just a really quick note to um, those asking questions. I, I saw a question pop up in the chat, but if you have questions, if you can drop them in the Q&A so we can see them in the same place, um, that would be great. Thank you. Um, Amy, is uh, cancellation on student debt, is that taxable? This is a great question. <laughs> um, um, so for public service loan forgiveness, it is not taxable at any time. That is that is part of the program um, rules that you will never be taxed on public service loan forgiveness. Um, until 2025, any other debt forgiven um, or canceled, you know, any other student debt that's canceled is not um, taxable at the federal level. Um, it may, it does vary by state. And so it depends, um, you know, if you have to pay state taxes on it, um, but the federal level until 2025, it is not, not taxable. Thanks so much, Amy. And then um, do you mind talking a little bit? We have a couple of questions about consolidation. If someone consolidates their loan, um, does that affect their their current monthly payment? Does it affect which income to repayment plan they'll they'll have to to be to be in? Hmm. This is a good question. Um, so if you consolidate your loans, there's a couple things that could change. One is that your interest rate might change. Um, you know, you might have uh, like a, you usually will have like a weighted interest rate between or among all the interest rates that you had on your other loans um, that you're consolidating. Um, and so, you know, that could affect your monthly payment. Um, that is true. Um, let's see, Kat, can you help me out with other things that might um, be affected by consolidating or other things that people should think about? That's a really great question. And so the first part that Amy mentioned was really important is that your payment amount might change. And so, for example, if you have an older loan and, you know, your interest rate was significantly lower at the point that you took out your loan versus what interest rates are now, um, like Amy was mentioning, your payment could, 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 could excuse me, potentially be higher. Um, also, this question was saying, you know, how do you know which payment plan you're supposed to be in? Also, you know, when you actually go through the consolidation process, you'll pick um, the repayment plan that you're going to be in. Um, so that also may change. But one thing that we always say is that we we generally cannot tell you exactly what to do. But the important thing is to know, one, to do the best thing for you. But for many people, particularly people who have still have Feller Perkins loans, um, in order to be able to get credit for many of these programs like PSLF, to get the additional credit through the IDR account adjustment that Amy mentioned, you're going to need to consolidate those loans into a direct loan in order to benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I think um, 
just like keeping in mind, like, you know, if you're on, if you're interested in the save plan, for instance, um, and because it might be most affordable for you, um, you know, there are loans that are excluded from that. So you might have to consolidate in order to get on the save plan. Um, and so it might, you know, you'd have to weigh like your options based on, you know, what type of plan you're on and what type of plan is best for you. Um, yeah, sorry, Kat, I just wanted to fill in. I, yeah, thanks for your help. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you for adding that in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then for the IDR account adjustment, do people have to have their consolidations complete by that day or do they just need to um, start the process for the consolidation? Yeah, good question. Um, so you have to have it, your application submitted. So you need to you know, actually submit your application before the 31st of December. It doesn't have to be processed by then. Um, it just has to be submitted. And so again, that takes about 30 minutes online. It's pretty, it's a pretty remotely, mostly pain, painless process. Um, and so uh, that's at studentaid.gov again. Awesome, thank you, Amy. And then another question for someone who previously worked for a qualifying employer. Um, so they're no longer in working for public service, they're still working, um, but they have a fell loan. Is there any benefit to them taking advantage from some of the steps right now, even if they aren't currently employed by um, a qualified employer? Hmm. Yeah, so um, I guess, you know, we never know like which way our career might turn. And so, um, you know, something, if you have past public service um, employment, that's, you know, that was, between, you know, right now and October 1st of 2007, when the program began, you could certify that time um, and get it, you know, uh, certified right now so that, you know, if at some point in the future you were planning to move back into public service, um, you know, you could get more time accrued. And so, um, what you know, some things that you could consider doing um, are, you know, make sure that you have direct loans. And if you don't have direct loans, then you can consolidate them um, to make them eligible for public service loan forgiveness. And then, you know, kind of raise your hand, fill out your paperwork to get um, that time, you know, that you count that that you had um, in the public service loan forgiveness while working for a public service employer to count. Um, and then, you know, you never know, like, where your career might take you and so and it might be you know even beneficial for you to go back to the public service if you're um you know you still have a loan balance and you're really looking to to get them canceled through pslf for some folks that you know that is the best option and so um yeah i bet i you know there are um not really many downsides to filling out your PSLF form and just telling the department of education that you're interested in PSLF and that you have time that was already accrued on the public service loan forgiveness program Thanks, Amy. That was a great. And while you do that, since we're talking about PSLF, I'm going to quickly answer another question that we have since it's on PSLF and then kind of switch gears. Someone was asking, um, saying they, you know, went online and started their PSLF application. Um, do they need to get their employer signature, um, employer signatures um, after going to um, studentaid.gov? So yeah. So once you get your um, PSLF application with, um, with your, with your, after you fill out those, you get those PSLF forms from um, federal student aid, you're going to want to get each of your qualifying employers to sign um, the respective form, just essentially saying, yes, you worked um, for that employer for the period of time that you stated. Really, really important thing to note, that signature has to actually be a physical signature. It cannot be a digital signature. I know it's a kind of an interesting quirk, but just telling you up front, just so where you're going through the process, of sharing it with your employer, um, you can you can make sure that they know that, and then you're going to submit those forms. Um, Mohila currently is the servicer for um, public service loan forgiveness, so if your servicer is already um, Mohila, you could just there's if you already have Mohila as your servicer, there are instructions on the site how to drop that form. Otherwise, you can follow the instructions on the PSLF form. Um, and then Amy, I'm sorry, if there's anything else I missed, please feel free to chime in there. But it's like, while we're on PSLF. No, that's really helpful. Thank you for answering that. Awesome. And then um, for people who have $0 IDR payments, does interest accrue? This is a good question. Um, so under most of the plans, it does. Um, this is one of the, the problems that has ex existed with income-driven repayment plans. Um, you know, folks were doing everything right, but they were logging into their accounts and seeing their uh, balances balloon each month. And so um, interest did, does keep accruing on IDR plans typically. Um, this new safe plan that was announced is, you know, eliminating all of the extra, the interest that accrues on your loan after you make a payment, which includes those $0 payments. Um, 
And so it, it depends. So on those three other plans, um, you know, under the income driven repayment kind of umbrella, um, you know, you will continue to accrue interest, but on that safe plan, you will not continue to accrue interest. And and I want to add to that, like, this is one of the reasons that they made it so that after 20 or 25 years, the remaining balance would be canceled because otherwise, you know, um, it would be impossible for folks to pay that off, right? Um, you know, there's no way when your, your, ba your balance is um, ballooning that much that you could ever pay that off. And so um, it's a great question. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, and then um, we have a question about um, a person um, with a parent plus loan and I'm just gonna take a second to actually go through this question. But um, so someone has a consolidated direct loan that was, um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, with an underlying parent plus loan. And they just mentioned that with the ICR plan, those payments are significantly higher than it is to be under the standard repayment plan under PSLF. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, at least with Parent Plus borrowers one, a little bit about the difference between being on the ICR versus if someone wants to be on the standard repayment plan, and then also um, just the different timelines to cancellation for those plans? Yeah, yeah, this is a good question. Um, okay, so essentially for Parent PLUS borrowers, there are, um, well, there are other options too, but like the main options, um, the ones that you mentioned that are on the table are really the standard plan and the income contingent repayment plan or the ICR plan. So standard and income contingent. Um, the standard plan generally, remember, has you paying off the entire balance of your loan, of that loan in 10 years. And so, um, you know, that is how that, that plan works. Um, the ICR plan um, is one of the income driven repayment plans. And so it will um, see your balance wiped out in, in 20 or 25 years. Um, for Parent PLUS loans, I believe it's 25 years, but can, can correct me if I'm wrong, Kat. That is um, correct. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's really gonna come down to, to what is more affordable and what makes the most sense for you. Um, but like we, you know, fully recognize that like probably neither of those options is completely affordable for folks. Um, and so um, these are higher payments, but you know, if we didn't have, you know, if you didn't have to make payments for the past three and a half years, it might, may, might make more sense to stay on the standard plan. Um, it might make more sense to stay in the ICR plan. Um, so it might just be a matter of like talking to your servicer, figuring out what is more affordable or, um, you know, what is quicker. Um, Unfortunately, you know, there's there's not a great option for parent plus borrowers um, in a situation like that. But if you have anything to add, Kat, please. Feel no, that was that was great. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, and then we have a question for someone who's an adjunct um, who who would otherwise qualify for public service loan forgiveness, but they just aren't meeting that mark in terms of the full time hour requirement. Um, do you mind talking a little bit about um, one, and this is actually a question generally for everyone, if people are able to get credit for PSLF, if they work part-time, but then two, do you mind talking a little bit about some of the, the changes we've seen in some places specifically for adjunct professors to um, adjust for this? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, okay, so generally, public service loan forgiveness. Remember, you have to have a qualifying employer and you have to work full time. You can have multiple part time jobs that add up to 30 hours a week. You just have to submit as many forms um, as you have employers for those time periods to make sure that you're getting to that 30 hours a week mark. For adjuncts and contingent faculty in particular, um, this has been a really stressful point for, for folks. Um, and so, so much so that they changed the rule this past summer. Um, Essentially, adjuncts and contingent faculty are able to multiply their hours by uh, a multiplier of 3.35 to, to tr in an effort to get them over that threshold of 30 hours a week, um, because they recognize that, like you know, the classroom time doesn't um, reflect all the time that folks are putting into prepping materials and grading and all these other things. Um, and so there is this multiple of 3.35 for folks that are working as adjunct instructors or contingent faculty. Some, um, you know, this is something that the Department of Education has said that they, that, that folks can do in order to get over that threshold. Some states are actually codifying it um, and making it mandatory. And so, for instance, Colorado passed this last year where, um, you know, folks can, 
can now have to, you know, like universities have to, um, you know, multiply by this multiplier in order to get people over that threshold. Um, and so you could look up, you know, if this exists in your state, um, and then also, you know, you can um, talk to your institution about this, about like, you know, having them sign off on um, this multiplier and getting your hours up over that threshold. Um, I hope that is sufficient. Yeah. <laughs> so much, Amy, that was so much information. Really appreciate that. Um, and then someone has a question. Um, Again, someone who has fellow loans is just concerned about consolidating. Their um, consolidation would significantly increase their their loan amounts. And so this person has a question about, is there likely there any legislation would change this? Um, do you mind talking a little bit about um, those options? Mm. Um, well, I wish I had a magic, magic eight ball to, to tell the future, um, but I... I... I don't know of anything on the horizon for fellow loans in particular. And, and the reality is that like these federal programs often mandate that you have direct loans. And so um, there's, you know, not often a, like um, it's often like a pre prerequisite to, to consolidate, to get a direct loan, to like enroll in one of these programs. Um, and so, you know, there could be something coming down the pike for fellow loans generally, but um, I think like it comes down to really weighing what your what your best options are, right? Like, um, it often comes down for people whether they can like actually pay off their loan or whether they're relying on one of these cancellation programs um, to get rid of their loans. And so, um, you know, for for many people, if you're able to do it, PSLF is often the best option because um, you know maybe your balance is really high and you know that you're never going to be able to pay off this amount of loans. Um, and so that's when you know PSLF really comes in. Um, comes in strong. And so um, I think, I hope that was a little bit of how helpful, but Kat, please <laughs> help me out yeah. if I. Yeah, yeah. No, that was a great answer. And I just really want to add for emphasis, like Amy said, um, really just two things that Amy said. One, we just really can't predict what's going to happen. I mean, we've seen so much change in the past couple of years, and we've also seen a lot of these time limited programs and we don't necessarily know. Also, if um, while we've seen many opportunities for relief, we also don't know, you know, some of the ones that have been time limited, if we'll have those opportunities again. Um, like we said earlier, and I'll just probably repeat again, I probably should have said at the outset, again, we can't tell anyone um, exact advice on what to do in their personal loan situation. But like Amy said, it's it's one of those, you know, you have to figure out the best um, the best option for your situation. A lot of times, you know, it's it's a choice between two pretty difficult options but um like amy said for a lot of programs they require people to have direct loans and there is this one-time opportunity to do so but we also do understand for many people that could significantly change um could change the the amount that they'd be paying on their loans and so again just would emphasize if you're considering doing these options, looking at the different repayment calculators on the Department of Education's website, just so at least you can maybe have an idea of what that would look like. Um, but great question and just really adding emphasis to everything that Amy said. Um, I'm gonna preface this by Amy, I also don't quite have an answer for this one. So if, seeing if you do, but yeah, um, this is a little bit of a difficult question. Um, are Is there any reason why someone might wanna opt out of, um, a discharge option. In this case, a person used um, TPD. And for those who are unfamiliar, that is the Department of Education's Total and Permanent Disability Discharge Program. Um, I don't know any specifics for this one. There are instances where possibly some people might want to opt out from other cancellation programs. But um, Amy, if you have an answer, jump in. If you don't, I kind of have a partial answer. Yeah, I think... Um... TPD is an interesting example here. I can't think of a reason why someone would want to opt out of T TPD, especially because it's very hard to get. Um, there's like a lot of hoops that you have to jump through. Um, you know, you're you're essentially having to admit to the Department of Education that you're no longer able to work, that you're um, using their words, that you're considered like totally and permanently disabled, you know? Um, and so I can't think of a reason why you might want to opt out of TPD, um, but, uh, there are other options, as Kat mentioned, you know, some folks um, have been kind of close or over the threshold of this 
IDR account adjustment and have opted out of getting their debt canceled because they had some loans that weren't eligible for um, the IDR account adjustment. And so they opted out within the proper time frame and then consolidated their loans so that they were all together on the same timeline. That's one of the benefits of consolidation is that you get your loans all on the same timeline and they're of the oldest loan, especially if you um, consolidate before December 31st. And so um, some folks opted out of the first round of, or the second round of the IDR account adjustment and then consolidated to get all their loans together. Um, and then they'll be kind of folded into another round of the IDR account adjustment. So um, that's one example I can think of where you might want to opt out. Um, but I, I can't, nothing's coming to mind for TPD in particular. And Amy, that was the best. <laughs> that's what I would have suggested. That's the only thing I can think of is that hanging loan situation. So thank you for answering that so thoroughly. Um, awesome. And then I think we just have oh, no, a couple more questions. Um, well, actually just one more question. <laughs> it looks like, oh, no two, sorry. <laughs> Scrolling chuckles. Um, is there an income phase out for the PSLF program? Is there ever an income cap to getting public service loan forgiveness? And then just adding one thing to this question. Is there also a cap to how much can be canceled under, under public service loan forgiveness? Yeah, good question. So there's no income um, phase out for the PSLF program. You could have any income and get PSLF. You can have any amount of uh, loans and get PSLF. The part where income comes into play is those income driven repayment plans, and it'll affect maybe how much money you have to pay each month on your student loans. Um, but you you could make a trillion dollars a year and get PSLF. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. And this question, um, we might need a little bit more detail to answer, but we'll try to answer the best that we can. Um, someone says, you know, they're close to that 10 year mark um, for public service loan forgiveness, but they've never been asked to recertify their income. Uh, would that be an issue for PSLF? Um, okay, so if you have never had to recertify your income, then that probably means, I'm, I'm just kind of guessing here, um, but it probably means that uh, maybe you were never enrolled in an income driven repayment plan, um, or maybe there was some, you know, problem with your servicer. And so um, you could check to see, you know, what type of repayment plan you're on and make sure you're on an income driven repayment plan. Remember, that's one of the, the, the kind of four requirements for PSLF is that you're on an income driven repayment plan. Um, and you should be recertifying every year. Um, or maybe, you know, if you didn't recertify, you were automatically placed onto the standard plan. That could also be an option. Um, and the standard plan is eligible for PSLF, but remember, um, those payments might be higher because it has you paying off the entire loan in 10 years anyway. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we obviously can't see your loan history here, but, you know, I think maybe just checking what type of plan you're on um, and getting on an income driven repayment plan um, if you aren't on one already, um, and then making sure your PSLF forms are, you know, signed and um, kind of on deck with your servicer. Um, as Kat mentioned, you know, the exclusive servicer for the public service loan forgiveness is Mohila. Um, and so if you don't have Mohila currently, but you're interested in PSLF and you've been working for a nonprofit or you have nonprofit um, time or government time that you want to get counted, um, you know, it's likely that you didn't fill out some paperwork at some point. And so making sure that you're kind of on track for PSLF in those ways, hope that helps. That was great, Amy. And then just really adding emphasis to the point about, um, and this is something that Amy said earlier, but also no matter what point you're at, you could still do this. Um, this is one reason why we really encourage people to submit their PSLF forms every year. And again, even if you haven't done that to this point, but you submit, say you're at eight years and you submit all, you know, you know, if you submit forms for all your qualifying employ employment for those eight years, um, it's really helpful because, for example, if you're if Mohila is your student loan servicer, and again, like Amy said, they are currently the exclusive servicer for public service loan forgiveness. There is a tracker, so you would be able to see that whether or not you're getting credit for those months that you're in repayment. And so um, that's also another way. Again, echoing everything that Amy said about you know double checking and, and ensuring that you're enrolled in an income driven repayment plan. But then also, you know, making sure, like she said, get those other forms in and just seeing um, also what your servicer says in terms of how far you are on track. Um, because we have seen issues where people get close to it and they find out the information a little bit late. So we always say it's better to know earlier um, than later. Um, and then someone says, um, someone's looking at their um, 
NSLDS report and it shows that their balance is zero, but they have yet to get an email. Um, does that mean that their student debt has been canceled? Um, and I'll let Amy answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it seems as though your loans have been canceled if your, your report is saying zero. Um, if you have a zero dollar balance at both your servicer site and at studentaid.gov, then um, I think that means that your debt is canceled even if you didn't receive an email. So um, yeah, I think unless Kat, you have anything to add, I think that that is a great note to end on. <laughs> I say congratulations and that sounds yeah, like amazing <laughs> yeah like amy said amy made a really really important note in there that just adding she said you know it what your nslds shows should be good but also check student.gov because that'll be a, 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 a nice way to double confirm but congratulations that's awesome um yeah yeah i think that's all the questions like you said amy let's end on a high note so <laughs> amazing let's end on a high note um, no, thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. I know this is like probably the last thing that you want to talk about in the throes of the holidays, but we appreciate you being here. Um, stay tuned for an email tomorrow um, with a recording and some resources as well. Um, and I hope you all have a great night. And thanks, Kat, for your help with the questions. <laughs> all right. Good night, everyone.